studies show that by age 50, approximately half of men and women will experience hair loss. No, it's not caused by washing your hair too much or brushing your hair too little, two of the many myths out there. The majority of hair loss with age is genetic for both women and men in the case of this study. Based on twin studies, the heritability of baldness in men is 79%, meaning about 80% of the difference in hair loss between men is genetically determined. But that still leaves some wiggle room. Even if you have identical twins, identical twin sisters in this case, with the same DNA, one can have more hair loss than the other thanks to increased stress, increased smoking, having more children, or having a history of high blood pressure or cancer. For example, check out these two identical twin brothers. Same genes, but the twin on the right reported more stress in their life. In this pair, the identical twin on the right was a smoker and drank more alcohol. Uh, smoking can contribute to the development of both male and female pattern baldness because of the genotoxic compounds in cigarettes may damage the DNA in hair follicles and, and cause microvascular poisoning in the base of the follicle. Other toxic agents associated with hair loss include mercury, because it seems to concentrate about 250-fold in growing scalp hair. In fact, maybe the reason Shakespeare started losing his hair was due to mercury poisoning from syphilis treatment. Thankfully, doctors don't give people mercury anymore. These days, as the CDC points out, mercury mainly enters the body through seafood consumption. Women of reproductive age frequently seek treatment for what is thought to be hormone-related hair loss, especially in menopause. But for example, this woman came in with hair loss and blood tests indicated elevated mercury levels, and no wonder, as she had a diet high in tuna. But the good news is that her mercury levels fell with elimination of dietary tuna. Within two months, her hair started to come back in seven months, maintaining a fish-free diet. Her hair completely regrew. So doctors should consider screening for mercury toxicity when they see hair loss, since there's something we can do about it. Instructing patients to reduce fish intake and repeat blood tests could offer relief of symptoms and uncover dietary habits that may be a source of heavy metal-induced hair loss. Though admittedly, sometimes heavy metal can lead to too much hair. What about nutrient deficiencies as a cause of hair loss? After bariatric surgery, the most frequent nutrient deficiency symptom is hair loss, but that's because they've had their anatomy rearranged to cause malabsorption on purpose. In general, there is little evidence to suggest that vitamin and mineral supplementation benefits people unless they're actually deficient. For example, we've known for centuries that scurvy, severe vitamin C deficiency, can cause hair loss. But once you have enough vitamin C such that your gums aren't bleeding, uh, there's no data correlating vitamin C levels and hair loss once you have a certain baseline sufficiency of vitamin C. It's also a myth that supplements containing zinc will increase hair growth, unless you have zinc deficiency, like if you're an alcoholic or something. But if you have normal zinc levels in your blood, taking more zinc won't help, and in fact can have negative side effects. Same thing with taking iron supplements. The most common ingredient in top-selling hair loss products is vitamin B7, also known as biotin. Yes, biotin deficiency causes hair loss, but there are no evidence-based data that supplementing biotin promotes hair growth. And severe biotin deficiency in healthy individuals eating a normal diet has never been reported. But if you eat raw egg whites, you can acquire a biotin deficiency, since there are these compounds that attach to biotin and prevent it from being absorbed. But other than rare deficiency syndromes, it's a myth that biotin supplements increase hair growth. But hey, why not just have the attitude, can't hurt, might help? Because of the lack of regulatory oversight of the supplement industry, and in the case of biotin, 
interference with lab tests. Many dietary supplements promoted for hair health contain biotin levels up to 650 times the recommended daily intake of biotin, and excess biotin in the blood can play haywire on a bunch of different blood tests, including thyroid function and other hormone tests, including pregnancy, also the tests they do to see if you've had a heart attack, so it could potentially even be life or death. And in terms of poor regulation, as I've done tons of videos about, there are all sorts of supplement manufacturer shenanigans. For example, this outbreak in which hundreds suffered selenium toxicity because they had an oopsie and put 200 times the dose, and so it ended up causing hair loss. And the same thing can happen with getting too much vitamin A. Any consumer looking on the internet for a treatment for hair loss is exposed to a multitude of remedies. However, we only have good evidence for efficacy for the FDA-approved drugs, finasteride, sold as Propecia, and minoxidil, sold as Rogaine. It's considered a myth that all the patented hair loss supplements on the market will increase hair growth, and they may actually be more expensive Expensive, with over-the-counter supplement regimens costing up to more than $1,000 a year, whereas the drugs may only be you know, one to $300. The drugs can help, but can cause side effects. The Propecia can diminish libido and cause sexual dysfunction, while the topical Minoxidil can cause itching, uh, though I believe this is a typo for scaling much better than scalping. Here's a more comprehensive list of the more common side effects. To understand why there are so many hormonal side effects for Propecia, like impotence, testicular pain, breast enlargement, you have to understand how the drug works. Androgens, uh, male hormones like testosterone, are the principal drivers of hair growth in both men and women. We know this from studies a half century ago that show that castration of men stopped hair loss. Why exactly were they being castrated? Due to eugenics laws in the United States. When mentally handicapped persons were castrated or had their tubes tied against their will, so-called retarded persons were routinely sterilized without their consent or knowledge, and we, the United States of America, was the first country to introduce eugenic laws, which were later upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. In the 1930s, a vocal proponent complained that the Germans are beating us at our own game. Anyways, uh, testosterone is the primary androgen circulating in the blood, and can be converted to dihydrotestosterone, which is even more powerful, by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. And that's the enzyme that's blocked by Propecia, so it inhibits the souping up of testosterone. That's why women are not supposed to take it, since it could feminize male fetuses, whereas for men it has the sexual side effects like erectile dysfunction, which can affect men for years, something the drug companies had to disclose for the last decade, a difficulty in achieving an erection that continues after stopping the medication, side effects that may even be permanent. Up to 20% of subjects reporting persistent sexual dysfunction for six or more years after stopping the drug, suggesting the possibility that it may never go away. What we think might be happening is that the drug may actually structurally change the part of your brain responsible for sexual function. And indeed, though blood levels of hormones in users with persistent effects appear normal, if you do a spinal tap and look at the cerebrospinal fluid surrounding their brains, neurosteroid levels do appear to end up being altered. So it's recommended that prescribers of finasteride, as well as potential users, be aware of the potential serious long-term risks of a medication used for a cosmetic purpose. To date, no new interventions are used routinely in the treatment of male or female pattern baldness. Given the side effects of the current drug options, there's a need for alternative treatments. So what about foods, uh, things we could eat to combat hair loss? That's exactly what we're going to explore next. 
Androgenic or androgenetic alopecia, also known as male or female pattern hair loss, is one of the most common chronic problems seen by dermatologists. Wait, so it's called male pattern hair loss and female pattern hair loss? Yeah, in men they call it male pattern hair loss, and in women they call it female pattern hair loss. OK. Either way, it's characterized by progressive hair loss, predominantly of the central scalp. I've talked about uh, hair loss supplements. I've talked about hair loss drugs. What about foods for hair loss? What role might diet play in the treatment of hair loss. Human experiments with fecal transplants offer a clue to how powerful our microbiome is, with reports of improvements in hair loss after a fecal slurry made from freshly passed stools from a donor was administered into another person's colon, and not just by a little. Totally bald guy starts growing back hair a few months after a fecal transplant, and a little over a year later, check it out, completely regrown. The moral of the story is not to drink brown smoothies, but to keep your good gut bugs happy. Population studies have found that male pattern baldness is associated with poor sleeping habits and the consumption of meat and junk food, whereas protective associations were found for the consumption of raw vegetables, fresh herbs, as well as the frequent consumption of soy milk. Drinking soy beverages on a weekly basis was associated with 62% lower odds of moderate to severe hair loss, raising the possibility that there may be compounds in plants that may be protective. Complementary and alternative medicine treatments boast the ability to cure hair loss safely and with less side effects than conventional medicine. However, it's important to look beyond the overarching claims in marketing to critically review the literature. For example, many studies have little relevance because the evidence was obtained on shaved rodents. Like, hey, let's smear shaved mice with bee venom. And even when they do clinical studies on actual people, sometimes there's no placebo control, so you have no idea if the food had anything to do with it. But there has been a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study of compounds in hot peppers and soy showing significantly higher promotion of hair growth. Here are some before and after pictures of both men and women. OK, but what kind of doses were they using? 6 mg of capsaicin a day, and 75 mg of isoflavones. OK, what does that translate out to in real food? You can get 6 mg of capsaicin in just a quarter of a fresh jalapeno pepper a day. Uh, that sounds pretty doable. And you can get 75 mg of isoflavones eating 3 quarters of a cup of tempeh, or just straight soybeans. Soy nuts are even more concentrated, uh, dry roasted soybeans, but given the formation of advanced glycation end products in high-fat, high-protein foods at high temperatures, I'd suggest avoiding routinely eating roasted or toasted nuts, seeds, or soy. There's also been a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial of pumpkin seed oil. Where did they get that idea? In 2009, a study out of South Korea found that randomizing men with BPH, enlarged prostate glands, to just 320 mg of pumpkin seed oil a day, that's about 16th of a teaspoon, so just like a few drops a day, improved urinary flow rates. Urinary flow continued to kink off and decline in the control group, but those taking the equivalent of just like eating two single pumpkin seeds a day saw significant improvement. Uh, that would seem to be an anti-androgen effect, so maybe it would help with hair loss? Seems to work in mice when used topically, but what about in people just eating pumpkin seeds? Couldn't hurt. Sadly, we often throw away pumpkin seeds, squash seeds, watermelon seeds, and they actually have a rich repertoire of nutrition, but you don't know if they actually work for hair loss until you put it to the test. 76 men with male pattern baldness received 400 mg of pumpkin seed oil a day, hidden in capsules, or they took capsules filled instead with a placebo for a few months. Again, that's only like eating two pumpkin seeds a day, maybe two and a half pumpkin seeds. And they measured scalp hair growth with all sorts of objective and subjective measures. And 
After 24 weeks of treatment, self-rated improvement and satisfaction scores in the actual pumpkin seed oil group was higher, and they objectively had more hair— a 40% increase in hair counts compared to only 10% in the placebo group. Here are some representative before and after shots of the improvement in hair coverage on two and a half pumpkin seeds worth of daily oil. Show those pictures to blinded investigators who don't know who's in which group, and they rate the placebo groups as getting slightly worse over time, but the pumpkin seed oil group getting significantly better. In the pumpkin group, 95% remained either unchanged or improved, whereas in the control group, more than 90% remained unchanged or worsened. Given such a pronounced effect, might we be worried about sexual side effects? They looked before and after an index of erectile dysfunction and found no evidence of adverse effects. Hundreds of millions of operations are performed every year, and the risk of death is typically around a half a percent, to which patients might say things like, I could just die as easily crossing the road, making it clear they really don't understand the difference in magnitude of risk. One way to communicate risk is by analogy. For example, just going under anesthetic carries about a 1 in 100,000 chance you won't wake up. How much is that? Well, that's about the same risk as an expert skydive. OK, but that still may be kind of hard to wrap your head around. It's hard to think in terms of small numbers. Like imagine discussing a 17 ten thousandths of a mile by 22.7 ten thousandths of a mile rug. Um, like, how big even is that? We need more digestible units. Enter the micromort as a unit of comparing and communicating risk to patients. A micromort is a unit equivalent to a one in a million chance of dying. One in a million is like the chances of flipping a coin and getting 20 heads or tails in a row, or a little less than the chances of getting a royal flush. But the real utility is to help compare different risks to one another using the same metric. For example, driving 100 miles entails about a one in a million chance of death, so that's one micromort. Scuba diving is like five micromorts per dive, so each dive is as risky as driving 500 miles. So now we have a way to directly compare the risk of surgical procedures in common activities. So like giving birth is as risky as driving from New York to L.A. and then back again, but getting a cesarean is more than twice as risky. Even something like a simple hernia repair carries the same risk of dying as like skydiving 200 times. Now, obviously, sometimes you have no choice, but death from varicose vein surgery or circumcision could probably be avoided. I was surprised to learn that regular horseback riding is like four times deadlier than rock climbing, uh, but like getting Chemo and radiation for head and neck cancer is riskier than rock climbing for 500 years, driving 5 million miles, or jumping 5,000 skydives, etc. One leading cause of death I really didn't talk about in How Not to Die is accidental death. We have approximately a 1 in a million chance of dying just by accident every day of our lives, and about half of that risk is dying in a car crash, based on U.S. averages. Then there's all sorts of other ways I'm surprised to learn. Americans have about a 1 in 200,000 chance every year of dying from a foreign body entering an orifice other than the mouth. Other things we may want to avoid include climbing Mount Everest, about 30 times riskier than coal mining or base jumping. Trains and planes are actually equivalent over the same distance, but riding a motorcycle is about 50 times deadlier than riding in a car, though cycling to a destination is riskier too, about 10 times as deadly as driving in the near term. Here's a good example of how one can use micromort comparisons to help put things in perspective. Certain types of breast implants can cause a rare type of cancer, a type of breast implant-associated lymphoma. 
You can imagine how scary this is for the millions of women who have implants, but check out the risk compared to the risk of other common activities. Your risk of dying from this kind of cancer is less than a single day of skiing. Now, it's probably better to die quick on the slopes and all the slow suffering of cancer with the risk of bankrupting your family, but at least it can put the risk of the implant cancer killing you in context. The American Journal of Clinical Nutrition is the highest-ranked peer-reviewed scientific journal in nutrition. That should tell you a lot about the field, since it's published by the American Society of Nutrition, whose sustaining partners include the Sugar Association, candy bar and soda companies, the corn syrup people, and the meat, dairy, and egg industries. And this is the highest-ranked nutrition journal. The fact that the National Cattlemen's Beef Association is a sustaining partner may help explain their publication of this article. Imagine you're in the pocket of big beef and big pig. How could you possibly pull off a study showing that eating red meat does not negatively influence cardiovascular disease risk factors? A meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials showing that eating more versus less red meat does not influence cholesterol or blood pressure? Doctors Barnard and Willett pointed out the fatal flaw in their editorial, the misuse of meta-analysis in nutrition research, by asking the question, compared to what? Of the 39 trials that they had chosen on LDL cholesterol, nearly 90% of them were just swapping one meat for another, comparing red meat to white meat. They were using chicken control diets or fish control diets. And we know that when it comes to cholesterol, the impact of beef consumption is just as bad as fish or poultry, and so that's how they pulled it off. They just swapped meats. That's like publishing a study saying total Twinkie intake does not negatively influence risk factors by switching Twinkies with ding-dongs. Those randomized to zero Twinkies didn't do any better. Yeah, because now they were eating ding-dongs. It's a classic drug industry trick, testing your drug against something known to be terrible. Whereas if you swap out meat for plant-based meats, plant-based sausages, plant-based chicken patties, and veggie dogs, you end up with significantly lower cholesterol. Well, duh, you say there's less saturated fat in plant-based meats. But even independent of saturated fat content, you end up with higher LDL cholesterol with red meat or white meat, any kind of meat, compared to non-meat protein sources. The researchers conclude that this is keeping with recommendations promoting diets with a high proportion of plant-based food, but based on cholesterol effects, white meat like chicken and turkey is just as bad as red. And fish may be even worse, though what they often did is try to standardize the saturated fat content by adding like butter. But at the same saturated fat content, fish appears to be worse than beef and chicken just as bad as beef. Yet plant protein sources like legumes, soy, and nuts, so beans, split peas, chickpeas, lentils, soybeans, and nuts, did better. Switch out a single serving of even lean beef with the same amount of calories of nuts or soybeans, and you can lower LDL bad cholesterol, a key risk factor for the number one killer of men and women in the United States and around much of the world. But wait. Is that why a single serving of nuts a day is associated with a 22% reduction in the risk of premature death? Why millions of deaths every year may be attributable to inadequate nut intake? Maybe the benefit is just because they're eating nuts instead of meat? No. The drop of heart attacks amongst more frequent nut eaters is just as strong or even stronger among vegetarians. The reduced mortality associated with nut consumption is independent of health condition. It's not just health nuts eating nuts. In fact, in a comparison of a dozen different food groups, nuts beat out even vegetables when it came to a lower risk of premature death. 
described as the last acceptable form of bias, weight stigma is the rampant discrimination and stereotyping of overweight individuals. Fifty overweight women were asked to keep a diary of all the times they felt they were being stigmatized for their weight. Over a single week, more than a thousand instances were recorded. An overweight woman may expect to be harassed, such as called names or insulted, run into physical barriers, like unable to fit into public seats, or discriminated against, such as perceived poor service at restaurants or stores, on average about three times a day. Obese men report three times less discrimination than women of the same size, so maybe it's only a daily occurrence for them. They're not just being paranoid. Studies using professional actors presenting as job applicants made up to appear overweight with the Hollywood magic of theatrical prostheses were significantly more likely to be discriminated against than when appearing as their normal weight selves. This employment bias was found to be especially prejudiced against overweight women compared to men. Attitudes can also be explored in surveys. In a comparison of 16 stigmatized social groups, such as homosexuals and homeless people, only drug addicts and smokers were regarded with higher levels of disgust than obese individuals. The researchers did note, however, there was effectively a tie. Obese people were, quote-unquote, rated just as disgusting as politicians. This weight stigma starts surprisingly young. Uh, children as young as three years old describe overweight peers as mean, stupid, lazy, and ugly. Then there was that famous study published back in 1961. Children in summer camps and schools across a swath of different social, cultural, and ethnic backgrounds in California, Montana, and New York were asked to rank the following images as to who they liked best including a child in crutches with a brace on their leg, a child in a wheelchair, a child with one of their hands missing, a facially disfigured child, or an obese child. In every population of kids they tested, there was remarkable uniformity. The obese child always came in dead last. Yeah, that was ages ago, though. But in 2003, researchers published the 40-year follow-up. The study was repeated, and the title of the study gives it away. The stigmatization of obese children getting worse. The obese child was liked even less. This parallels trends throughout society, with nearly a 70% jump in perceived weight discrimination recorded in national surveys since the mid-90s. Attitudes among teachers may not be helping. More than a quarter of teachers and other school staff surveyed felt that becoming obese is one of the worst things that could happen to a person. Even parents can be biased, providing less support for college for their overweight daughters compared to thinner siblings. As two prominent obesity researchers commented, it is a strong prejudice indeed when parents discriminate against their own children. What about doctors? One representative national survey found that more than half of physicians viewed obese patients as awkward, unattractive, ugly, and noncompliant. About a quarter of nurses agreed or strongly agreed to the statement, caring for an obese patient usually repulses me. This antagonism can have serious health consequences for those who may need it the most. For example, obese women are at higher risk for developing cervical, endometrial, and ovarian cancers, yet they are less likely to be screened. Morbidly obese patients only have about half the odds of getting their recommended pelvic exams. A part of this may be avoidance on the part of the patient, but some doctors just turn obese patients away. The Sun Sentinel polled OBGYN practices in Florida and found that as many as one in seven refused to see heavier women, for example, setting weight cutoffs for new patients starting at 200 pounds. Even doctors who welcome obese patients have been found to give them short shrift. Physicians randomized to receive a medical chart of a migraine patient who was either presented as average weight, overweight, or obese, said that they would give the obese patient about 28% less of their time, and it's less quality time. 
Recorded doctor's visits found physicians tend to build less emotional rapport with overweight patients. Even obesity specialists profess increasingly explicit anti-fat attitudes. Worsening in surveys taken between 2001 and 2013, obesity specialists described fat people as significantly more lazy, stupid, and worthless. Even in the medical literature, you'll find lines like this, an example from the Annals of Internal Medicine, obesity is an aesthetic crime, it is ugly. The good news is they appear to be able to hide their disdain. In a study entitled Obese Patients Overestimate Physicians' Attitudes of Respect, despite the negative attitudes doctors harbored towards their obese patients, the same patients expressed their satisfaction with their providers. The researchers concluded while physicians may be successfully playing the part, the lack of true respect suggests the authenticity of the patient-physician relationship should be questioned. Although total fasting can dramatically increase blood levels of the stress hormone cortisol as much as doubling within five days, uh, just dieting alone does not. There is, however, a way stress and obesity could turn into a vicious cycle. Weight stigma. Across thousands of individuals followed for four years, those reporting discriminatory experiences had more than twice the odds of becoming obese, and those who started out obese had more than three times the odds of staying that way compared to those who started out at the same weight but didn't experience discrimination. Now this could be from stress-induced eating on one side of the calorie balance equation, or stigma-induced exercise avoidance on the other. Obese individuals with more frequent experiences with weight stigma report greater avoidance of exercising in public, feeling judged and embarrassed. These too-fat exercise fears may be well-grounded. Strong anti-fat biases have been documented in both fitness professionals and regular gym goers, which may translate into an unwelcoming environment in fitness centers and health clubs. Whichever side of the calorie equation gets tipped, those who experience weight stigma can also end up suffering health consequences independent of any added weight. Those reporting more frequent fat prejudice exhibit higher levels of depression, higher levels of inflammation, and higher levels of oxidative stress, as well as a shorter lifespan. Two studies following a total of nearly 20,000 people both found about a 50% increase in mortality risk among those reporting greater daily discrimination. Weight discrimination may shorten life expectancy. Despite these hazards, some scholars advocate for even more fat shaming. The president emeritus of the prestigious Hastings Center infamously advocated for a kind of stigmatization light, using social pressures to compel people to lose weight without resorting to outright discrimination. After all, he argued, what else has the potential to counter the persuasive force of the billions spent in advertising every year by the food and beverage industry? It worked against tobacco. He recalls his own battle with addiction. The force of being shamed and beat upon socially was as persuasive for me to stop smoking as the threats to my health. The public health campaign to stigmatize cigarettes turned what had been considered simply a bad habit into reprehensible behavior. When such campaigns have been tried, they've been met with fierce resistance, though. Georgia's Strong for Life campaign featured billboards of morose-looking obese children with captions like, Warning, chubby kids may not outlive their parents. Or, It's hard to be a little girl when you're not. The campaign sponsors defended the ads as an attempt to break through the denial in a state with some of the highest recorded childhood obesity rates. It's only defensible, though, if it works. Yale researchers found that when normal weight women are provided with bowls of M&Ms, jelly beans, and chips to snack on after watching clips of stigmatizing material like clumsy, loud, lazy stereotypes getting teased about their weight, they eat about the same amount compared to watching neutral material, such as insurance commercials. But when overweight women watch the same two sets of videos, they triple 
their calorie intakes after watching the stigmatizing scenes. The researchers concluded this directly challenges the notion that pressure to lose weight in the form of weight stigma will have a positive, motivating effect on overweight individuals. In other words, it could make things worse. Being labeled too fat in childhood was associated with a higher risk of becoming obese compared to children weighing the same who were never told that. But does that mean we should just ignore the elephant in the room? Many doctors apparently think so. Just as veterinarians have been found to be reluctant to tell people their pets are obese, fewer than a quarter of parents of overweight children report having been told by pediatricians about their child's weight status. One might think it would be obvious, but a Gallup survey found that parents appear to be notoriously poor judges of their children's weight. Similarly, the percentage of adults who describe themselves as overweight has remained essentially unchanged over the past few decades, despite skyrocketing obesity. All this, Gallup concluded, helps paint a picture of mass delusion in the United States about its rising weight. I think patients have the right to be informed. Those told by their doctor that they are overweight have about four times the odds of attempting weight loss and about twice the odds of succeeding. Just as smoking physicians are less likely to challenge their smoking patients, overweight physicians are less likely to bring up the subject of weight loss or even document obesity in their charts. Ironically, overweight patients trust diet advice from overweight doctors more than docs who are normal weight. Unfortunately, primary care physicians appear to have little to offer in terms of specifics. Fewer than half who were surveyed said they provide specific advice to their patients. Just telling patients to watch what they eat is unlikely to be particularly helpful. But many primary care physicians may not even get that far. Most physicians said they would spend more time working with patients on weight management if only their time was reimbursed appropriately. Maybe we could offer a bonus to refrain from blaming the victim. As one pair of commenters wrote in response to the pro-stigma camp, if shaming reduced obesity, there would be no fat people. I want to end this weight stigma video series with the jaw-dropping findings of a study that I think best illustrates how hard it is to live inside a fat body. If this doesn't foster sympathy among my medical colleagues, I don't know what will. Researchers talked to men and women who had lost and kept off more than 100 pounds to tap into their unique insight, having personally experienced what it's like to be morbidly obese, and then, on average, 126 pounds lighter. 47 such individuals were interviewed. They were asked to think back to when they were heavier and make a choice. If someone offered you a couple million dollars, if you stayed morbidly obese forever, would you have chosen the money, or would you have chosen to be normal weight no matter what? Option number one was, I would have chosen no money in being normal weight. It would have taken me about a second to decide. Option number two was, I probably would have chosen being normal weight, but the possibility of having that much money would make me think about the choice. And option number three was, I wanted to be normal weight, but I really could use the money. If I would be a multimillionaire, I think I could live with being morbidly obese. One of the 47 had to think about it, but the other 46 jumped at option number one. No one chose option number three. They all said they would give up being a multimillionaire to be normal weight. If that shocked you, buckle your seatbelts. They were then asked about being obese compared to other disabilities. Uh, normally, when you ask people to choose between living with their own disability or switching to a different one, there is a strong proclivity to stay with their own. Uh, for example, even though most people would rather be deaf than blind, blind people prefer to remain blind by a large margin rather than having sight without sound. They already know how to cope with their own disability, and so their safety and familiarity. However, the exact opposite happens when the formerly obese were asked. Every single one of the 47 said they'd rather be deaf for the rest of their lives than obese. 
Every single one said they'd rather have difficulty reading, be diabetic, have very bad acne or heart disease than be obese. More than 90% said they'd rather have a leg amputated, and similarly, about 9 out of 10 said they'd rather be blind their whole lives than obese. Obesity appears to be the only handicap where nearly everyone wants to switch, uh, no matter what the cost. To quote one study subject, when you're blind, people want to help you. No one wants to help when you're fat. In 2019, a series of reviews were published in the Annals of Internal Medicine that concluded the same thing that past reviews have concluded. Adherence to dietary patterns lower in red or processed meat intake may result in decreased risk for premature death, cardiometabolic disease and mortality, meaning the risk of getting and dying of diseases like heart disease and type 2 diabetes, as well as the risk of getting cancer and dying from cancer. Therefore, they concluded in their dietary guideline recommendations, continue your current red meat consumption, continue your processed meat consumption. Wait, what? Yeah, premature death, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, but keep eating your burgers and bacon. To understand what just happened, we have to go back to 2015. The dietary guidelines had just had the audacity to recommend people reduce their sugar intake. Imagine you work for the sugar industry. The evidence is overwhelmingly against you. What do you do? Well, what did the tobacco industry do? One method involved the tobacco industry's funding of and involvement in seemingly unbiased scientific groups to manipulate the scientific debate concerning tobacco and health. Groups like the ILSI, the International Life Sciences Institute, which has enjoyed a long and serious collaboration with the tobacco industry, that same industry group shapes food policy around the world. The International Life Sciences Institute, technically a nonprofit with an innocuous-sounding name, has been quietly infiltrating government health and nutrition bodies around the world. It was created by a top Coca-Cola executive and almost entirely funded by Goliaths of the agribusiness, food, and pharmaceutical industries. After decades largely operating under the radar, the Institute is coming under increasing scrutiny by health advocates in the United States and abroad who say it's little more than a front group advancing the interests of the 400 corporate members, among them Coke and Pepsi. So when the 2015 Dietary Guidelines advised eating less sugar, the soda-funded International Life Sciences Institute sponsored a review, concluding that the guidelines on sugar were simply not trustworthy. Who did they pick for this hatchet job? Bradley Johnston. And here it is, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, the scientific basis of guideline recommendations on sugar intake, and concluded there basically wasn't one. Guidelines on dietary sugar do not meet criteria for trustworthy recommendations, as they are based on low-quality evidence. This comes right out of the tobacco industry's playbook, Cast Doubt on the Science, said Professor Marion Nessel. This is a classic shameful example of how industry funding biases opinion. Yes, the paper was paid for by the likes of Coca-Cola, Hershey, Red Bull, and the makers of Oreos, but the authors swore they wrote the protocol and conducted the study independently. Turns out that was a lie, forcing the journal to publish a corrected version after the Associated Press obtained emails showing the industry front group requested revisions. It also came out that a co-author conveniently forgot to mention a 25 grand grant she got directly from Coca-Cola. You know it's bad when candy bar companies criticize an industry-funded paper on sugar. The makers of Snickers, Skittles, and M&Ms broke ranks with other food companies and denounced the industry-funded paper. They themselves were a member of the ISLI, but Come on, telling people to ignore guidelines to cut down on sugar, that's just making us all look bad. 
If you look at the relationship between funding source and the conclusions in nutrition-related scientific articles, there's like seven or eight times the odds that the conclusion will skew favorably compared to studies with no industry funding. For interventional studies, the proportion of studies paid for by industry that reached unfavorable conclusions about their own products was a big fat 0%, which should not surprise anyone. So what can journals do to counteract the tactics that industry often uses to advocate for the safety of unsafe products, or question the integrity of science that calls their products into question? To combat the tobacco industry's influence over scientific discourse, leading journal editors have refused to be passive conduits for articles funded by the tobacco industry. They just won't accept tobacco industry-funded studies, period. Accordingly, high-quality journals could refrain from publishing studies on the health effects of added sugars funded by soda and cookie companies, but they're not. This was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And so, four years later, with the next batch of dietary guidelines on the way, and the last scientific report of the Guidelines Committee encouraging people to eat diets not just lower in sugar, but lower in meat as well, big beef decided to follow in the footsteps of Big Butterfinger. Same journal, same guy, same scientist for hire, Bradley Johnston as lead author, and the rest is history. We'll dig into exactly how he pulled it off next. In 2016, a Washington-based lobby group published a scientific review which concluded that evidence in favor of guidelines recommending limits on added dietary sugar was low quality and did not meet criteria for trustworthy recommendations. This was a group funded by multinational food and agrochemical companies, from Coke to Monsanto, to the captains of corn syrup, accused of hijacking the scientific process in a disingenuous way to sow doubt and jeopardize public health. But exactly how did they get away with it? Here's their paper. Questioning the Scientific Basis of Guideline Recommendations on Sugar Intake. Using the GRADE approach, they concluded that the overall quality of evidence to support such recommendations was low to very low. GRADE stands for the Grading of Recommendations Assessment, Development, and Evaluation Initiative, which was developed to make clinical guidelines more evidence-based. And thank heavens for that! Clinical guidelines, like which drug to give to whom, used to be developed by like the gobset method, just some good old boys sitting around a table. Under grade, high-quality evidence appears to be derived exclusively from randomized trials. Uh, this is not surprising, given that the grade process was designed for drugs. And of course, you want your drugs put to the test. Like, remember the Premarin story, where for a decade organizations recommended that clinicians encourage postmenopausal women to use hormone replacement therapy because women who were taking it appeared to have fewer heart attacks. But when put to the test, randomized controlled trials instead showed the opposite. Uh, so we definitely want drugs put through randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials where people are randomized to take the drug or unknowingly take a placebo instead, and no one knows who's in which group until the code is broken at the end, and you see how well the two groups did compared to each other. Everyone agrees that randomized controlled trials are enormously valuable in many areas of medical research, such as the testing of drugs. But wait a second, how do you do that with diet? I mean, there's no such thing as a placebo diet. How can you randomize people to different diets, but somehow hide from them which diets they're following? People tend to notice what they put into their own mouths. And RCTs, randomized controlled trials, are so expensive, they typically last for only weeks or months, but it takes most cancers decades to develop. So it's nearly impossible to see if like, you know, different diets prevent or cause cancer that way. To see if smoking causes cancer, you can follow large cohorts of smokers and non-smokers out for decades to see who gets cancer and who doesn't. But it's not like you can randomize people to smoke or not smoke for decades. When studying lifestyle interventions, you often just can't do randomized controlled trials, and even if you could, it might not be ethical. Take crib death, for example, sudden infant death syndrome. A pivotal study studying the habits of infants who died 
discovered that sleeping on their stomachs was a risk factor, so we started educating parents face up to wake up. And the SIDS rates dropped. What more do we need? Would it even be ethical to randomize thousands of babies to sleep on their backs or fronts and count up the deaths at this point? Uh, you can get sufficient evidence to make lifestyle recommendations that save lives without randomized controlled trials. Critical questions like what dietary pattern produces the best health outcomes over a lifetime simply can't be answered with randomized controlled trials. You can't randomize people to different lifetime diets and expect them to stick to them, so we need to compile an amalgamation of evidence from other study designs. But the lack of evidence from randomized controlled trials has become a, a common argumentation strategy for criticizing nutrition recommendations. Similar claims were made by the tobacco industry in its attempt to discredit evidence on the harms of tobacco. Case in point, the so-called Sound Science campaign carried out by Philip Morris. This is all straight out of the tobacco industry playbook. Philip Morris used public relations firms and lawyers to develop a sound science program that involved recruiting other industries and issues to obscure the tobacco industry's role. They tried to enshrine, quote-unquote, good epidemiological practices that would make it impossible to conclude that secondhand smoke and thus other environmental toxins caused diseases. Public health professionals need to be aware that the sound science movement is not an indigenous effort from within the profession to improve the quality of scientific discourse, but rather reflects sophisticated public relations campaigns controlled by industry executives and lawyers whose aim is to manipulate the standards of scientific proof to serve the corporate interests of their clients, and not just tobacco clients, but hopes to expand to the food, plastics, and chemical industries. Philip Morris went beyond just creating doubt and controversy about the scientific evidence to attempting to change the scientific standards of proof. But randomized controlled trials aren't the only source of good evidence. As Sir Bradford Hill himself said, who pioneered the randomized controlled trial, any belief that the controlled trial is the only way to go would mean not just that the pendulum had swung too far, but that it had come right off the hook. While randomized controlled trials are highly reliable in assessing interventions like drugs, they're harder to do with diet. Dietary diseases can take decades to develop. It's not like you can give people placebo food, and it's hard to get people to stick to assigned diets, especially for the years it would take to observe effects on hard endpoints like heart disease or cancer. That's why we have to use observational studies of large numbers of people and their diets over time to see which foods appear to be linked to which diseases. And interestingly, if you compare data obtained from observational population studies versus randomized trials, on average there's little evidence for significant differences between the findings, not just in the same direction of effect, but of the same general magnitude of the effect in about 90% of the treatments they looked at. But wait, what about the hormone replacement therapy disparity I talked about in the last video? It turns out when you go back and look at the data, it was just a difference in timing in terms of when the Premarin was started, and they actually showed the same results after all. But even if observational trials did provide lower quality evidence, maybe we don't need the same level of certainty when we're telling someone to eat more broccoli or drink less soda, compared to whether or not you want to prescribe someone some drug. After all, prescription drugs are the third leading cause of death in the United States. It goes heart disease, cancer, then doctors. 100,000 Americans wiped out every year from the side effects of prescription drugs taken as directed. So given the massive risks, you better have rock-solid evidence that there are benefits that outweigh the risks. You're playing with fire, so darn right I want to randomize double-blind placebo-controlled trials for drugs, but when you're just telling people to cut down on donuts, you don't need the same level of proof. In the end, the industry-funded sugar paper concluding that the dietary guidelines telling people to cut down aren't trustworthy because they're based on such quote-unquote low-quality evidence is an example of the inappropriate use of the drug trial paradigm in nutrition research. 
You say, yeah, but what were the authors supposed to do? If grade is the way you judge guidelines and you can't blame them, but no, there are other tools like, for example, NutriGrade, a scoring system specifically designed to assess and judge the level of evidence in nutrition research. Now, one of the things I like about NutriGrade is that it specifically takes funding bias into account, so industry-funded trials are downgraded. No wonder the industry-funded authors chose the inappropriate drug method instead. Helm is another one. Hierarchies of evidence applied to lifestyle medicine, specifically designed because existing tools such as GRADE are not viable options when it comes to questions that you can't fully address through randomized controlled trials. In a way, each research method has its own unique contribution. In a lab, you can explore the exact mechanisms, RCTs can prove cause and effect, and huge population studies can study hundreds of thousands of people at a time for decades. Uh, take the trans fat story, for example. We had randomized controlled trials showing trans fats increased risk factors for heart disease, and we had population studies showing that the more trans fats people ate, the more heart disease they had. And so, taken together, these studies forged a strong case for the harmful effects of trans fat consumption on heart disease, and as a consequence, it was largely removed from the U.S. food supply, preventing as many as 200,000 heart attacks every year. Now, it's true we never had randomized controlled trials looking at hard endpoints like heart attacks and death, because that would take years of randomizing people to eat like canisters of Crisco every day. You can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good when there are tens of thousands of lives at stake. Public health officials have to work with the best available balance of evidence there is. It's like when we set tolerable upper limits for lead exposure or, or PCBs. It's not like we randomized kids to drink different levels of lead and saw who grew up to have tolerable brain damage. You can't run those kinds of experiments, so you have to just pull in evidence from as many sources as possible and make your best approximation. Even if RCTs, randomized controlled trials, are unavailable or impossible to conduct, there's plenty of evidence from observational studies on the nutritional causes of many cancers, such as on red meat increasing the risk of colorectal cancer. So if dietary guidelines aiming at cancer prevention were to be assessed with the drug-designed grade approach, they'd reach the same conclusion that the sugar paper did, low-quality evidence. And so, no surprise, a meat industry-funded institution hired the same dude who helped conceive and design the sugar industry-funded study, and boom, lead author, saying we could ignore the dietary guidelines to reduce red and processed meat consumption because they used grade methods to rate the certainty of evidence, and though current dietary guidelines recommend limiting meat consumption, their results predictably demonstrated that the evidence was of low quality. Before I dive deep into the meat papers, one last irony about the sugar paper. The authors used the inconsistency of the exact recommendations across sugar guidelines over a 20-year period to raise concerns about the quality of the guidelines. Now, obviously, we would expect guidelines to evolve, but the most recent guidelines show remarkable consistency, with one exception the 2002 Institute of Medicine guideline that said a quarter of your diet could be straight sugar without running into deficiencies. But that outlier was partly funded by the Coke, Pepsi, Cookie, Candy-funded institute that is now saying, see, since recommendations are all over the place, thanks in part to us, they can't be trusted. A series of articles published in the Annals of Internal Medicine culminated in a recommendation suggesting people keep eating their red and processed meat. Nutrition researchers savaged these articles. The chair of nutrition at Harvard called it a very irresponsible public health recommendation, and the past Harvard nutrition chair was even less restrained. It's the most egregious abuse of data I've ever seen, said Walt Willett. There are just layers and layers of problems. Let us start to pick through these layers. First of several serious weaknesses was that the analyses and recommendations were largely based on the so-called GRADE criteria, which I talked about in my last video. The authors erred in applying the GRADE tools, since that was designed for drug trials. GRADE automatically scores observational studies as low or very low scores for certainty of evidence, 
which is exactly what you want when you're evaluating evidence from drug trials. You want a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial to prove the drug's risks and benefits. However, the infeasibility for conducting randomized clinical trials on most dietary, lifestyle, and environmental exposures makes the criteria inappropriate in these areas, since it would involve you know, controlling people's daily diet and following them for decades. You can't do a double-blind, placebo-controlled trial of red meat and other foods on heart attacks or cancer for dietary and lifestyle factors. It's impossible to use the same standards for drug trials. Uh, like imagine telling one group of people to smoke a pack of cigarettes every day for the next 20 years to prove that cigarettes cause lung cancer. And how could you make it double-blind, uh, like have the control group smoke placebo cigarettes? Yet in the meat papers, they were downgrading studies due to lack of blinding. Well, Duh! I mean, in, in nutrition trials, how are you going to blind people to the fact of what they're eating? Right? Great is just the wrong tool for diet studies. In fact, the authors admit that the reason their recommendations differ from all the others is that other guidelines have not used the great approach. And the reason is you can't randomize people to smoke, uh, avoid physical exercise, breathe polluted air, or eat a lot of sugar or red meat, and then follow them for 40 years to see if they die. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you have no evidence. It just means you have to look at the evidence in a more sophisticated way. And alternative approaches to grade exist, like, for example, NutriGrade, which have specifically been developed to evaluate evidence from studies of nutritional and lifestyle factors. So are the author's appeals to standards of evidence motivated by a genuine interest in getting to the bottom of it, or just to advance the financial interests of industry, as the same lead author had done previously at the behest of soda and candy companies? The tool he employed in his meat and sugar studies could be misused to discredit all sorts of well-established public health warnings, like the link between secondhand smoke and heart disease, uh, air pollution and health problems, uh, physical inactivity and chronic disease, or trans fats. Industries could use it to sow doubt in any field where randomized controlled trials are not feasible, such as you know, climate change. Uh, what are you going to have, some <laughs> placebo planet? Strict adherence to grade guidelines could even be used to question the link between smoking and lung cancer. I know you can't randomize people to smoke, but can't you randomize people to quit? A randomized control trial of the effect on aged men of advice to stop smoking. Of those randomized to quit, 13.7% died within the study window, whereas of those in the control group who got no special instruction, only 12.9% died. In other words, it didn't work. Disappointingly, the researchers concluded, we find no evidence at all of any reduction in total mortality. Wait, so is smoking not bad for you after all? Of course not. Anyone see the fatal flaw? They didn't randomize people to quit. They randomized people to advice to quit smoking. Right? It's not like they could lock people in a room for a few years. At last follow-up, the Stop Smoking group was smoking 8 cigarettes a day compared to 12 cigarettes a day in the control group, so no surprise there was no difference in mortality, since there was hardly any difference in smoking, and the same thing with diet. There have been massive randomized dietary trials, the Women's Health Initiative, the Multiple Risk Factor Intervention Trial, that wasted hundreds of millions of dollars because people just flat out failed to follow the dietary advice. So the groups ended up eating similar diets at the end, so had similar disease outcomes, just like the randomized smoking quit trial. And it's not like the failure was a result of inexperienced investigators. These trials were conducted by some of the very best research teams who invested enormous efforts to achieve their goals. But it just shows you can't really run decade-long randomized trials that require changes in eating behavior. People just won't do it. Randomized controlled trials couldn't even show an effect on mortality of smoking, which is pretty remarkable, considering that smoking is one of the most powerful known risk factors in the world. So basically, the foregone conclusion putting any kind of junk to the test in this matter would echo the New Meat Report conclusion that people should eat whatever they want and do whatever they want. It's like a hijacking of evidence-based medicine. Of course we want the best evidence possible, but the whole process is now being manipulated and misused to support subverted or perverted agendas. It's very exciting and attention-grabbing to say there's no need to reduce meat intake, it's less exciting to say we reviewed studies to evaluate the validity 
using a system not meant to evaluate the validity of these studies, and what we found is nothing. When asked whether physicians can advise persons whether a salad is healthier than a bowl full of sugar, one of the senior co-authors of the Meat Papers responded that physicians should tell persons that the quality of evidence is low, so it depends almost entirely on their preferences. When grade criteria do not allow us to strongly recommend against smoking a cigarette with your bowl of sugar, we believe that alternative grading systems are preferable. A series of articles published in the Annals of Internal Medicine recommending people just keep eating their meat was decried by nutrition researchers as irresponsible and unethical, a travesty of science, an assault on public health, and the most egregious abuse of evidence that they had ever seen. There were calls for retraction even before it was published from eminent public health leaders, from a former U.S. Surgeon General, former President of the American College of Cardiology, and the directors of preventive medicine and nutrition institutes from Harvard, Yale, Tufts, and Stanford. In my last video, I explained the how, the method by which they manipulated the science, but never really got to the why. I mean, the lead author's similar attempt to discredit the sugar guidelines was explicitly paid for by an industry front group funded by the likes of Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, Mars candy bars, and Pepsi. But if you look at the meat paper at the panelists' declared conflicts of interest, they all say they didn't have any, including the lead author who was involved in the sugar study, whose primary funder wasn't just representing big soda and candy, but the likes of McDonald's and one of the largest meat packers in the world. Yet Johnston didn't disclose that as a potential conflict of interest when he switched from exonerating sugar to exonerating meat. What did he have to say for himself? Even though the sugar study was published in 2016, he got the money for it in 2015 outside of the three-year mandatory disclosure window. This is the same guy who said the industry front group had no role in writing their paper until the Associated Press revealed the truth, and the journal had to publish a correction. But Johnston doubled down this time, saying it is tenuous at best to suggest that his earlier work on sugar had any influence on how his team made the new meat recommendations. The important thing is we have no relationship with the meat industry. Oh, really? A few months later, the truth came out. Correction in the so-called Nutrirex panel meat recommendations. Oops, Bradley Johnston failed to indicate he had gotten a grant from Texas A&M AgriLife, which gets millions of dollars a year from the meat industry to do things like run beef boot camp, or espouse the health benefits of beef brisket, or promote the celebration of National Bacon Day. After all, Texas A&M AgriLife serves pork producers to improve pork producer profitability. This is the group that not only gave Dr. No Relationship with the Meat Industry Johnston a direct grant for over 75 grand, but they officially joined the whole Nutrirex consortium to provide, as Dr. Johnston explained, generous support to impact nutrition-related decision-making and policy in North America and beyond. Yet none of this was disclosed in the paper. No even potential conflict of interest, yet they had formed a partnership with an arm of Texas A&M partially funded by the beef industry, to the tunes of millions a year from the beef industry alone. Oops. In fact, Patrick Stover, Mr. No Conflicts of Interest, is the director of AgriLife. And a month before the meat paper was published, Bradley Johnston was offered and accepted a tenured position at Texas A&M AgriLife, was already working for them when it was published, but didn't think to mention it. So when the Annals initially sent out a press release, which they later corrected, saying no need to reduce red or processed meat consumption for good health, they may have been simply acting as a mouthpiece for meat industry propaganda. The pseudoscience presented in the Annals meat papers appears to have been written solely to create doubt and confusion in the wider population. The misleading recommendations were not intended to convince scientists who clearly understand the nature of the relationship between meat and health, and for that matter, sugar and health. 
the pseudoscience is presented solely to create doubt and confusion in the wider population. Frankly, industry will do what it needs to do to push as much of its product into the world as it can, and so will do what it needs to do to obfuscate the relationship between its products and human and planetary health. Uh, they've done it with tobacco, fossil fuels, Monsanto's Roundup, sugar, and now meat. A series of papers published in the Annals of Internal Medicine that largely discounted all but the highest quality randomized studies reached a conclusion directly contrary to the public health advice we've heard for years. They suggested that we should continue our current consumption of both red and processed meat. The authors based their exclusion of evidence on the so-called GRADE criteria, which were mainly developed for evaluating evidence from drug trials. We need randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials for drugs, but strictness of these criteria would probably cause evidence for just about every dietary, lifestyle, and environmental factor related to chronic disease to be graded as low or very low evidence. If the grade criteria were used to evaluate the evidence for other factors related to diets, such as inadequate fruits and vegetables, or too much soda or alcohol, or whether or not uh, exercise is good, or safe sex, or sleep, smoking, air pollution, none of the current recommendations on these issues would be supported by high or even moderate quality evidence using the drug trial criteria. But even after ignoring major parts of the available evidence, they still found an association between meat intake and an increased risk of cancer. And not just cancer, they found that adherence to dietary patterns lower in red or processed meat intake may result in a decreased risk for premature death, cardiometabolic disease, and mortality, meaning the risk of getting and dying of diseases like heart disease and type 2 diabetes, as well as the risk of getting cancer and dying from cancer. Yet they still concluded in their dietary guideline recommendations, continue your current red meat consumption, continue your processed meat consumption. Forget the whole premature death thing, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, just keep eating your burgers and bacon. So you have these dietary guidelines developed by some self-appointed panel that are tantamount to promoting meat consumption, despite their own findings that high consumption is harmful to health. How do they square that, contradicting the evidence generated from their own meta-analyses? Uh, there's only one body of evidence. They found the same risk that all the other reviews found. So they're not saying meat is less risky, they're just saying the risk is acceptable. Well, you do have to consider the risks and benefits. Well, we've covered the harms. Their own data show that a moderate reduction in red and processed meat consumption can reduce total mortality by 13%, heart disease mortality by 14%, cancer mortality by 11%, and type 2 diabetes risk by 24%. What are the benefits? In short, omnivores enjoy eating meat. Uh, okay. Given people's attachment to their meat-based diet, the associated risk reduction in our leading killers, like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, is not likely to provide sufficient motivation to reduce consumption of red meat or processed meat, so therefore, eat up. In fact, they even say straight out that unlike the other dietary guidelines suggesting we limit consumption of stuff because of like the cancer thing, these other guidelines have paid little or no attention to the reasons people eat meat, whereas they did a systematic review of preferences regarding meat consumption, and people who eat meat enjoy eating meat. Maybe that's even why they do it. They're generally unwilling to change their meat consumption, even in response to health concerns, so the panel believed the panel, you'll remember, with generous support of a group getting millions every year from the meat industry, the panel believed that for the majority of individuals, the desirable effects, like lowering your risk of family-devastating cancer and heart attacks associated with reducing meat consumption, probably do not outweigh the undesirable effects, like having to give up all that yummy meat. This is what led them to make their recommendation to continue current consumption. That sounds like something straight out of the journal Meat Science. Why should we keep eating red meat? Because of the enjoyment. Uh, people also like to smoke. They like to drink soda. They like to have unsafe sex. I mean, it's kind of like saying, we know motorcycle helmets can save lives, but 
some people still prefer the feeling of the wind in their hair, so let's just tell people to not wear helmets. But you'll actually see this argument. Complying with dietary recommendations imposes a taste cost on consumers, so how about socially desirable dietary recommendations that are most compatible with consumer preferences? You know, that best balance health benefits against taste cost. So like, hey, even if science told us that eating butter is unhealthy, its taste justifies the continuation of using it. What do you expect from Nutrex, the meat industry partnered panel that also published the paper criticizing the sugar guidelines funded by the soda and candy industries? They aim to produce nutritional guideline recommendations based on the preferences of patients. So what's next? Just telling people to eat donuts and ice cream all day? Yet the annals published the meat papers with a press release saying no need to reduce red or processed meat consumption for good health. Using the same methodology and rationale, they might as well have said no need to quit smoking for good health, or no need to exercise for good health. As Dr. Katz, director of Yale's Prevention Research Center, put it, guidelines opposing the very data on which they purport to be based are not science, they are anti-science. Across the board, a series of studies published in the Annals of Internal Medicine found a statistically significant association between lower consumption of red and processed meats and lower total mortality, meaning living a longer life, lower cardiovascular disease mortality, as well as lower risk of dying from cancer. Yet, remarkably, the authors of these studies concluded that people should ignore all the other dietary guidelines and keep eating meat to their heart's content, or rather discontent. They offered three reasons why their panel reached a conclusion at odds with other contemporary dietary guidelines that advise people to cut down on meat. One reason is taste. In short, people who enjoy eating meat enjoy eating meat. I did a whole video on this. Uh, but in short, taste preference probably shouldn't be a major factor in developing dietary guidelines. Uh, many people don't want to quit smoking, stop drinking, or exercise more, but that doesn't change the science. Right? It shouldn't change the public health recommendations. A second reason they explain why their recommendations differ from everyone else's is that other guidelines didn't use the so-called GRADE approach. And no wonder, since GRADE was mainly developed for evaluating evidence from drug trials. There are grading systems for diet and lifestyle approaches, but the meat panel chose to inappropriately apply GRADE, which could similarly be misused to undermine recommendations about tobacco, air pollution, trans fats, you name it. And I've got three videos delving deep into all that. But this video is about the third reason they give for ignoring meat reduction advice. Other guidelines didn't highlight the very small magnitude of the meat effects. In other words, even if meat does cause heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and death, it doesn't cause that many heart attacks, doesn't kill that many people, cause that much cancer, to offset all the juicy taste benefits. Of course, it matters what people replace the meat with. Uh, replacing even 3% of calories from animal protein with plant protein is linked to living longer. But eggs were the worst. Yes, replacing red meat protein with plant protein sources may lower overall mortality more than 10%, but getting rid of egg protein? And we're talking more than 20% lower risk of premature death. So if someone reduces meat consumption by swapping a burger for an egg salad sandwich, that particular reduction in meat could mean more mortality. But maybe they concluded there was such a small effect only because major bodies of evidence were omitted, and relevant studies excluded because the authors didn't like the results. It's not that there aren't tons of randomized controlled trials about meat, it's just that they appeared to cherry-pick a few to fit their agenda, discarded studies that even met their own criteria, and wrongly rejected randomized controlled trials clearly showing that meat increased risk factors like cholesterol or blood pressure, uh, like why wasn't Predimed included, or, or the literally hundreds of randomized trials on the DASH diet? What about the Lyon Diet Heart Study, which involved randomizing individuals to a more Mediterranean diet with a significant drop in meat consumption? Compared to the control group, they experienced a 70% reduction in mortality from all causes put together. 
Why did they exclude that study? They excluded it because, in their words, it reported an implausibly large treatment effect. In other words, it worked too well. No surprise, given that this so-called Nutrirex meat panel was partnered with and had multiple people on the payroll of Texas A&M AgriLife, which receives literally millions of dollars in meat industry money every year. So you probably won't be shocked to find out they also excluded research comparing health outcomes of vegetarians to meat eaters. As they described it, they were interested in realistic decreases in meat consumption, like you know, cutting down three servings a week. In fact, the study that they mostly relied on, the Women's Health Initiative, achieved only a difference of 1.4 servings of meat per week. That could be like a half an ounce difference in meat consumption per day, about a fifth of a hamburger. Participants in the Women's Health Initiative reduced meat intake only modestly, resulting in a modest reduction in mortality related to breast cancer. This finding in no way supports the notion that there is no need to reduce red or processed meat consumption for good health. Rather, it shows that modest dietary changes yield modest benefits. As an analogy, if studies showed that modest reductions in tobacco use yielded only modest health benefits, it would be inaccurate and dangerous to suggest that there's no need to reduce tobacco use for good health. To say that small increases in meat consumption only cause small increases in the risk of disease doesn't mean that eating meat is good for you. That's like saying that you know, smoking 24 cigarettes a day increases your risk of lung cancer only a little more than smoking 20 cigarettes a day. Being careful not to include any studies that compared smoking 24 to smoking none, and then erroneously concluding that smoking isn't that bad for your health. Despite all that, Despite the ignoring evidence, excluding evidence, the meat panel nonetheless found entirely consistent, clinically meaningful, statistically significant adverse effects of eating more meat and processed meat on all-cause mortality, on cardiovascular disease, on cancer, and on diabetes, that they did so despite all the obstacles they put on the path to this finding is nearly incredible, and directly bespeaks the magnitude of adverse effects of meat and processed meat intake on health. Based on their meta-analyses of large cohorts, dietary patterns with, again, just a moderate reduction in red and processed meat consumption were associated with lower total mortality by 13%, lower cardiovascular disease mortality by 14%, lower cancer mortality by 11%, and a 24% reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. We spend tens of billions of dollars a year trying to tweak risk factors by about this magnitude, and this one intervention a reduction in meat consumption, appears to do all those things at the same time. I mean, there are statin drugs that can reduce heart disease risk, but actually increase risk for type 2 diabetes and have little effect on cancer. I mean, if there was a drug that did as much for your health, it would be a multi-billion dollar blockbuster. The chair of nutrition at Harvard estimates a moderate reduction in red meat consumption could prevent 200,000 deaths per year. Now, the meat panel can call that a very small effect if they want to, but I imagine it's no small effect to those 200,000 families. The numbers they found is on par with the amount of cancer and heart disease attributable to secondhand smoke, and based on the same kind of studies, population studies. It's not like they randomize people to sit in smoky rooms all day for a couple years but no rational person who looks at the public health data around the effectiveness of smoke-free zones would argue that people should continue exposing themselves to secondhand smoke, so why do the same for red meat and processed meat? The smoking analogy is actually a good one. Imagine researchers select studies with extremely small between-group differences in the number of cigarettes smoked per week. They avoid any studies that actually compare smoking to non-smoking, i.e. meat-eating to vegetarian. They find that despite the small differences in exposure, there is still a clear and consistent benefit to smoking less. They then apply methods of grading the evidence that strongly favor randomized trials over all other methods. Since there are few, if any, randomized trials of smoking, they conclude that they have very low confidence in the reliability of their own findings. On that basis, they publish guidelines recommending that the public simply continue to smoke. After all, they reason, people who smoke like smoking. That really does sum up the annals' papers in a nutshell. 
That reminds me of a quote from a famous paper published in 1958, compiling all the most poignant evidence linking smoking and lung cancer after coming up against those same charges of inadequate proof. This quote could just as well have been written about the state of science on meat today. If the mountain of evidence they found had been made on some new agent, uh, to which hundreds of millions of adults had not already been addicted, and on one which did not support a large industry skilled in the arts of mass persuasion, the evidence for the hazardous nature of the agent would be generally regarded as beyond dispute. According to the Global Burden of Disease study, diets high in processed meat like bacon, ham, hot dogs, lunch meat, sausage, may kill off more than 100,000 people every year, mostly due to heart disease, but also cancer and diabetes, resulting in millions of healthy years of life lost every year around the world. And it doesn't take much. The Union of Concerned Scientists estimated that if Americans could cut down to an ounce a week, thousands of annual cancer deaths could be averted. But that's on a population scale. How can we better understand our individual risk? Though the Nutrarex panel in the Annals of Internal Medicine meat papers I've done the last few videos about discarded their own findings, using their numbers, a reduction in red and processed meat consumption is associated with a 13% lower risk of premature death. What exactly does that mean? Like, what does a 13% increased risk of death mean? To get a better handle on it, let me introduce the concept of micro-lives. Acute risks, such as riding a motorbike or going skydiving, may result in an accident. A good way to compare such risks is with a unit known as a micromort, defined as a 1 to a million chance of sudden death. I did a really fascinating video about it recently. However, many risks we take don't kill you straight away. Uh, think of all the you know, lifestyle frailties we get warned about, such as uh, smoking, drinking, eating badly, not exercising, and so on. So the, the micro-life aims to make all these chronic risks comparable by showing how much life we lose on average when we're exposed to them. A microlife is defined as 30 minutes of your life expectancy. Uh, why is that? Well, someone in their 20s, a 22-year-old man or a 26-year-old woman, may have on average about 57 years left. That's about 20,000 days, or 500,000 hours, or a million half hours. Aha! So that's how they define a microlife, a reduction of one of the million half hours we may have left. Here are some things that would, on average, cost a 30-year-old man one microlife. Smoking two cigarettes, drinking two pints of beer, or every day they live 11 pounds overweight. See how helpful this can be in terms of comparing risks? So like drinking a pint of strong beer cuts your life expectancy short as much as smoking one cigarette. If it's unthinkable to you to have so little respect for your own health that you'd light up twice a day, maybe one cigarette in the morning, one at night, then it should be just as unthinkable being 11 pounds overweight. Alternately, you can compare life-extending behavior. Uh, for example, eating at least five servings of fruits and veggies a day may add an average of four years onto your lifespan for men and three years for women. That's up to twice as beneficial as exercising every day. But check it out. Exercise for 20 minutes, and you add an hour to your life two micro lives. Uh, so for all those who say they don't have time to exercise, it's like a 3 to 1 return on investment. Give 20 minutes of your life to get 60 minutes of life. Beyond that, there's a bit of diminishing returns, but exercise an hour a day and get back more time than you put in. OK, so what about the meat? Each burger is associated with the loss of a micro life. So it's as if each burger were taking 30 minutes off your life. So lifespan-wise, one burger appears equal to two cigarettes. If it wouldn't occur to you to light up at lunch, maybe you should choose the bean burrito instead. And processed meat is even worse. There's a couple equivalent ways you could say it. Uh, imagine two people 
who are identical in every way, except that one eats around 50 grams of processed meat a day, which is like uh, one large sausage or hot dog or a few strips of bacon, and the other eats none. Eating that single serving of processed meat every day is expected to take about two years off the length of your life. Two years less with your loved ones, your grandkids, your spouse, two more years of mourning. Or you could think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. Eating a bologna or ham sandwich every day, just two slices of deli meat, is expected to take around one hour off your life each day. Don't think there's ever enough hours in a day? Well, you may have effectively one less, depending on what you pack for lunch. Alternately, you could think about it in terms of effective age. Eating 50 grams of processed meat a day is expected to add around two years onto your effective age, meaning basically give you the annual chance of dying of someone two years older. In summary, wrote the chair of nutrition at Harvard and colleagues, the Nutrirex meat recommendations suffer from important methodological limitations and involve misinterpretations of nutritional evidence. To improve human and planetary health as a side bonus, dietary guidelines should continue to emphasize dietary patterns low in red and processed meats and high in minimally processed plant foods such as fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and legumes, beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. Let me end with a quote from Dr. Dean Ornish about the Annals meat papers that suggest that people should continue to eat meat with abandon. His lifestyle heart trial was one of the many studies the meat panel ignored. It showed that a plant-based diet and lifestyle program could reverse the progression of even severe coronary heart disease, the number one killer of men and women. The control group actually made modest reductions in meat comparable to those in the Annals review and showed continued worsening of their atherosclerosis. I take solace, Ornish said, in knowing that the light drives out the darkness. But these days, the light has to be very bright indeed. Caveat emptor. Don't be fooled. Your life may depend on it. Over the next few decades, the number of new cancer cases will continue to skyrocket. Are we winning the war on cancer? Sadly, in general, no. This, despite the introduction of hundreds of new anti-cancer drugs, the war on cancer has been likened to the war on terror. Uh, no matter how many drone strikes you do, it's nearly impossible to kill all the bad guys, and no matter how precise the bombing, one must always consider the collateral damage. The toxicity from cancer therapy can be debilitating, and not just health-wise, there's also the financial toxicity. Patented anti-cancer drugs are priced at up to nearly $1,000 a day. Even with health insurance, the average cost of patients for you know, stage 4 breast cancer, for example, can run $190,000. It's bad enough to be fighting for your life without bankrupting your family at the same time, a problem still common to this day. Who can forget the apocryphal story of Walter White, working two jobs with health insurance and still could not afford the cancer care? Now, not everyone is willing to start their own meth lab, but many are willing to go for broke. A large proportion of cancer patients reported their willingness to declare bankruptcy or sell their homes to pay for treatment. I mean, look, I mean, aren't the high prices justified if new and innovative treatments offer significant benefits to patients? Um, but you may be shocked to find out that many FDA-approved cancer drugs may lack clinical benefit. Well, then how did they become FDA-approved? Most approvals of cancer drugs are based on flimsy or untested surrogate endpoints and post-marketing studies rarely validate the efficacy and safety of these drugs on patient-centered endpoints. Uh, let me explain what that means. New chemo drugs are increasingly approved just based on so-called surrogate endpoints, which means uh, instead of looking at what we really care about, survival or quality of life, they approve drugs based on things like response rate, uh, tumor shrinkage. Uh, but who cares if a tumor shrinks if it doesn't actually extend your quantity or quality of life? Right? It's kind of counterintuitive, but just seeing a tumor shrink on a CT scan or an MRI is not necessarily correlated with improvements in survival or symptoms. 
In fact, most studies that have actually followed people out found low correlations with survival. The most recent comprehensive analysis found 90% of studies of such validation trials found little correlation with overall survival. Of 36 new chemo drugs approved by the FDA based on these kind of surrogate endpoints, once they were actually put to the test in the real world, only one in seven was actually shown to extend life, and half explicitly flopped, and the rest remain untested, revealing that most cancer drug approvals have not been shown to, or do not, improve clinically relevant endpoints. Exorbitant drug prices are bad enough for treatments that work, but charging vulnerable patients for drugs without evidence that they actually improve patient survival and quality of life is unconscionable. Why doesn't the FDA require proof that chemo drugs actually benefit patients before approving them? Drug companies say that requiring randomized controlled trials with meaningful measures would take too long. But the study time reduction using surrogate endpoints rather than overall survival is estimated at just 11 months. So instead of it taking 7.3 years to come to market, on average, it would take 8.2 years. Yes, look, we want to get these drugs out as soon as possible, but only if they're actually going to help people. Do cancer drugs improve survival or quality of life? You don't need to know, according to our broken regulatory system. And Things aren't much better over in Europe. A systematic evaluation of chemo drug approvals showed that most entered the market without evidence of benefit on survival or quality of life, and even years later there was still no conclusive evidence that these drugs offered any benefit, and when they did, the gains were often marginal. That's why you see editorials in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute referencing Hans Christian Andersen, the author of The Tale of the Emperor's New Clothes. The studies all converge on a singular conclusion. Only a minority of new cancer drugs approved by U.S. and European regulatory authorities in recent years deliver clinically meaningful benefits to patients. In fact, some cancer-related deaths may be hastened or even caused by the toxic effects of chemotherapy rather than the cancer itself. Based on a review of tens of thousands of cancer patients, in as many as 27% of cases, the cancer treatment itself caused or hastened death. OK, but it might be worth that risk if the potential benefit is large enough. And that's the subject of my next video. How much does chemotherapy improve survival? Though we often hear new cancer drugs described as game-changing breakthroughs, most afford much more modest benefits. In my last video, I quoted a recent editorial in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute suggesting that the majority of new cancer drugs don't deliver clinically meaningful benefits at all. At least when they're later proven to be ineffective, they're pulled from the market, right? No. Even when post-market studies show the new drugs to have no clinical meaningful benefit, uh, compared to not just older drugs, but compared to nothing, uh, compared to a sugar pill, most chemo drugs retain FDA approval and remain on the market, even at the same ridiculous prices. In fact, the most expensive drug they looked at, the one costing $169,836 a year, did not improve overall survival at all, and actually worsened quality of life. $169,000 just to make you feel worse with no benefit. Why pay a penny for a treatment that doesn't actually help? And even when they do improve survival, what does that actually mean? Currently the trend is for Big Pharma to design large trials that may detect statistically significant, but often trivial differences in survival endpoints. Uh, for example, check out this famous trial. Adding this second drug, erlotinib, to gemcitabine for advanced pancreatic cancer significantly prolonged overall survival. Um, yeah, they suffered more side effects, but we're not just talking about tumor shrinkage. They lived significantly longer. The placebo group only lived 5.91 months, whereas the added drug group survived all the way to 6.24 months? Wait a second. They only lived a third of a month longer? That's just 10 days, right? All the side effects and expense for an average of just 
10 days? I mean, that's why doctors shouldn't use the statistical jargon, significant improvement in survival, while informing patients about benefits of new treatment. Uh, when patients hear the word survival, they're not thinking about a week and a half. If you put all the new chemo drugs together approved over the last dozen years, the average overall survival benefit is 2.1 months. Now look, I mean, uh, two months is two months. I don't want to downplay that. But you know, time and again, surveys have indicated that patients expect much more. Incredibly, about three-quarters of patients with metastatic lung or colorectal cancer did not report understanding that their chemo was not at all likely to cure their cancer. I mean, that's the primary treatment, but the chemo's not curative. It's just eking out a few extra weeks or months. Why weren't the majority of patients told that? Uh, it's not that they were being over-optimistic, explained the researcher. Uh, they were under the mistaken belief that the treatment offered a chance of cure when it in fact didn't. That deprives patients of the opportunity to you know, weigh the risks and benefits and make their own decisions about their own body. If you ask cancer patients, uh, most want at least a half a year to stomach the side effects, which suggests that most cancer patients might not choose chemotherapy if they knew how little they'd actually benefit. But look, everyone's different. You know, one patient they interviewed said living even one week longer would be worth it, uh, whereas another said they wouldn't even want to do chemo for two extra years of life. They wouldn't want anything to interfere with the quality of the time they had left. Either way, people deserve to know the truth. Uh, I find it telling that oncologists and cancer nurses themselves express less willingness to accept intensive chemotherapy given the associated toxicities. Most chemo drugs are cytotoxic, meaning they work by killing off cancer cells, but they also kill off some healthy cells as collateral damage, which is you know, uh, why they can damage our nerves, uh, cause you know, irreversible heart failure, slough off the linings of our gut, or damage your immune system. And drug companies frequently downplay the risks, though. For example, describing this breast cancer drug as having acceptable side effect profiles for most patients, or, or this pancreatic cancer drug is having a manageable and mostly reversible safety profile. Uh, these were studies published in top medical journals. Right? Naturally, readers would take these statements to be true. However, if you actually look at the data, the number of serious, even life-threatening side effects was double, or even five times higher, on the new breast cancer drug. And the manageable and mostly reversible side effects evidently weren't referring to those who were killed by the drug. I like how they even uh, included like a, a cheat sheet. Acceptable toxicity? Acceptable to whom? Right? Manageable? Uh, serious events and deaths can never be considered manageable and feasible. Who would sign up for a drug whose toxicity could only be described as feasible? Favorable? Uh, compared to what? Tolerable? Uh, uh, that's for the patient to decide. And any drug that kills people can hardly be considered safe. Still. Patients may very well consider it worth the risk. Uh, for some cancers, we've made you know, tremendous strides. Right? Testicular cancer, for example, there's greater than a 1 in 3 chance that chemotherapy could enable you to survive at least to the 5-year mark. Same with Hodgkin's disease, a relatively rare form of lymphoma. But even when you know, researchers try to err on the side of overestimating the benefit, for most common cancers, colon, lung, breast, and prostate, the chances appear to me more like 1 or 2 percent. In my video, The Benefits of Fenugreek Seeds, I profiled this study, in which young men were randomized to a sugar pill, or fenugreek capsules, for eight weeks, and got a significant improvement in upper body strength, lower body strength, and body composition, a significant reduction in body fat percentage. And the only side effect? It can make your sweat and pee smell like maple syrup. Seems like a bonus. Studies on immature castrated rats suggest the fenugreek muscle bulking is a testosterone effect, but we didn't know what happens in humans until now. Four randomized controlled trials put it to the test and saw a significant boost of total blood testosterone. 
And indeed, fenugreek appears to improve sexual function in men, for example, doubling the frequency of morning erections. What about the sexual function in women? While the estrogen hormone estradiol stimulates vaginal lubrication and blood flow, facilitating a woman's capacity for sexual arousal and orgasm, it's the testosterone that's linked with sexual desire in both men and women. Drug companies have tried testosterone patches on women to try to increase sexual desire, but we're concerned about blood clots and long-term safety. What about a little fenugreek? a significant increase in testosterone compared to placebo, and a boost in the estrogen estradiol, which resulted in both an increase in sexual desire and function, translating to about a doubling of sexual activity compared to placebo. If fenugreek causes an increase in estrogen levels, what about the efficacy of fenugreek for reducing menopausal symptoms? A significant reduction in menopausal symptoms across every single domain for example, cutting the weekly numbers of hot flashes and night sweats in half over a period of three months. Other hormonal effects include an improvement in painful periods. Uh, what I like about this study is that they didn't use some proprietary extract, but just straight plain fenugreek powder that you'd you know, buy at the store. Now, they packed it into capsules just so they could pit it against a sugar pill placebo, but the dose they used is about a third of a teaspoon three times a day, taken the first three days of their period. A third of a teaspoon would cost less than five cents, and boom, a significant decrease in pain, and also appeared to improve other symptoms as well. While we're on a roll with hormonal effects, what about the effectiveness of fenugreek as a galactagogue? No, not another sci-fi reboot. A galactagogue is something that increases breast milk production in lactating mothers, and fenugreek fits the bill, and not just by a little. In this randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial in which breastfeeding women took less than a quarter teaspoon of fenugreek, less than a quarter teaspoon of ground ginger, and about a sixteenth of a teaspoon of turmeric every day, doubled their milk production within a month about a 50% increase by week two, and a 100% increase by week four. However, due to its potential stimulation on the uterus, fenugreek seeds should not be used during pregnancy, though this is all based on laboratory animal data. Better safe than sorry. Many of the diseases that cause a constant drain on healthcare budgets can be prevented by proper nutrition. So why aren't the big payers getting involved? I mean, even like a 1% decline in excess body fat could alone save tens of billions. You'd think at least the health insurance industry would try to get people to eat healthier to try to pay out less money. Well, uh, one could say the insurance industry actually benefits from high health care costs, because these rising costs are simply passed on to both individuals and employers in terms of higher premiums, and insurers take a fixed percentage of these premiums as increasing profits. They get a piece of the pie, so the bigger the pie, the unhealthier everyone is, the bigger their piece. As such, insurers have not done as much as they could to help reduce health care costs, because lower costs would hurt their bottom line. What if there was a medication that could successfully treat and even reverse heart disease, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and many other chronic conditions without any negative side effects, and offered the promise of dramatically reduced health care costs? Imagine all the advertising there would be to promote it. Imagine how much they would charge. A drug that cannot just treat but cure diabetes and these other diseases? Uh, then what if you were told that medication exists today, is available to everyone in unlimited quantities at a low cost, but the vast majority of the American public has never heard about it? You want a solution to significantly reduce health care costs? The solution is to use food as medical treatment, specifically foods made from minimally processed plants. One of the main barriers is simply the current widespread belief that once someone has a chronic condition, such as heart disease, type 2 diabetes, there's very little that can be done to actually reverse the disease, and the best outcome possible is to maintain the condition so that it just doesn't get any worse.
The fact that a whole food plant-based approach provides a safe, effective, low-cost alternative to not just eliminating symptoms, but potentially reversing the underlying condition without drugs or surgery, is unknown to a vast majority of Americans. In contrast to the pharmaceutical industry that spends large sums to market new drugs, there are not big profits in promoting a plant-based diet. The politics surrounding health care is who's going to pay for it, instead of what kind of health care is best. And the evidence is overwhelming that a whole food plant-based diet provides the best opportunity to not only reduce the growth in spending, but actually decrease total health care costs more than any drug, medical procedure, insurance reform, or provider payment model out there. Thankfully, the word is spreading. A review of the evidence published in Kaiser Permanente's journal concluded that physicians should consider recommending a plant-based diet to all their patients, especially those with high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or obesity. Kaiser has followed up with user-friendly guides, freely available online, for both physicians and patients, explaining the benefits and practical aspects of implementing a plant-based diet. So hey, why aren't all insurers sending out such information to all their members? Right? Uh, you know how all the drug ads are like, ask your doctor if this drug is right for you. Well, you know, members could be prompted to ask their physicians about the ability of plant-based diets to reduce or eliminate prescription drug use, reverse disease. So of course, these materials would also have to list all the side effects. Side effects include increased energy, lower blood pressure, improved digestion, all while eating unlimited quantities of satisfying food. Ask your doctor if plants are right for you. When we eat meat, dairy, eggs, seafood, our gut flora can take certain components in them, carnitine and choline, and produce something that ends up as a toxic compound called TMAO, which may set us up for a heart attack, stroke, and death. So give people two eggs, and you get a spike of TMAO in your bloodstream within hours of consumption. Because gut bacteria play a critical role in this process, though, if you then give them a week of antibiotics to wipe out their gut flora and refeed them two more eggs, nothing happens. Uh, no TMAO in their bloodstream, because they have no egg-eating bacteria to make it but give it a month for their gut bacteria to start to grow back, and the eggs start to cause TMAO production once again. Same thing with meat. Give people the equivalent of an 11-ounce steak, and TMAO levels shoot up in the blood, but feed them the same amount after a week of antibiotics, and nothing happens. So to run into problems, you need both the meat and the meat-eating bugs. Uh, that's why you can feed a vegan a sirloin, and they don't produce TMAO within their body, they just don't have the meat-eating bugs in their gut. OK, now this should all be old news for those who have been following the science. The reason for this video is to show that this phenomenon happens the other way around, too. When we eat whole plant foods, like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, along with nuts and seeds, our gut flora can take certain components in them, fiber and resistant starch, and produce short-chain fatty acids, which can set us up for the prevention of human diseases. Short-chain fatty acids like butyrate can help seal up a leaky gut, fight inflammation, prevent weight gain, improve insulin sensitivity, accelerate weight loss, and fight cancer. But these benefits rely on two things, eating fiber and having fiber-feeding bugs, just like the detrimental effects from TMAO required not only eggs, dairy, or meat, but also the eggs, dairy, or meat munching bugs. Check this out. If you give people whole intact grains, in this case barley kernels, also known as barley groats, three servings a day, like I recommend in my Daily Dozen app, within just three days of eating that extra 30-plus grams of fiber and resistant starch, their gut bugs were so happy and produced so many short-chain fatty acids that people's insulin levels improved by 25%, which means their bodies needed to produce less insulin to take care of the same amount of white bread, while still dampening the blood sugar spike. But this was on average. Some people responded to all that extra fiber with beautiful dips in blood sugar and insulin responses, but in others, the same amount of fiber and resistant starch didn't work at all. Why? 
because you don't just need fiber, but fiber-feeding bugs like Prevotella. How do you get more Prevotella so you can take full advantage of the health benefits of plants? Eat more plants. Prevotella abundance is associated with long-term fiber intake. If you look at rural African children eating 97% whole food plant-based diets, their Prevotella is off the charts uh, compared to kids eating standard Western diets, and this is reflected in the amount of short-chain fatty acids they are churning out in their poop. In the industrialized world, it's those habitually eating vegetarian and vegan that promotes the enrichment of fiber-eating bacteria in the gut. Here's the relative Prevotella abundance between those who eat meat, no meat, or all plants. Uh, this may help explain the worse inflammatory profile in omnivores than in vegetarians. Based on the findings relative to bacteria abundance, the researchers suggest that exposure to animal foods may favor an intestinal environment which could trigger systemic inflammation and insulin-resistance-dependent metabolic disorders such as type 2 diabetes and it's the reduced levels of inflammation that may be the key factor linking a plant-based gut microbiota with protective health benefits. Yeah, but can't meat-eaters eat lots of plants too? Omnivores have constraints on diet-dependent gut microbiome metabolite production. In other words, it's the flip side of the vegan eating a steak. They can eat all the fiber they want, but may be lacking in fiber-munching machinery. At low levels of fiber intake, the more you eat, the more of the beneficial short-chain fatty acids are made, but at a certain point your available fiber feeders are maxed out. There's only so much you can benefit. But those habitually eating a plant-based diet have been cultivating the growth of these fiber feeders, and the sky's the limit, unless of course you're eating vegan junk. But whole food plant-based diets, should be effective in promoting a diverse ecosystem of beneficial bacteria to support both our gut microbiome and our overall health. When James Parkinson first described the classical symptoms of the disease, he could hardly foresee the evolution of our understanding over the next 200 years, like the role of nutrition. Increasing Parkinson's disease risk with high dietary intakes of animal fat, iron, mercury, and dairy products, whereas the intake of antioxidants in a plant-based dietary pattern may be protective. Plant-based diets are known to preserve body tissues from oxidative stress and inflammation, both hallmarks of chronic degenerative diseases like Parkinson's. On the contrary, animal-based foods, particularly rich in animal proteins and saturated fats, are correlated with the promotion of neurodegenerative diseases, in addition to some of the leading killers like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, etc. Not all plants are necessarily good, though. For example, the potential neurotoxicity of graviola, a fruit known as soursop. Consumption of soursop can lower blood pressure and uric acid levels, but may also cause an atypical form of Parkinson's disease, because the fruit contains neurotoxic compounds. And indeed, population studies do show a link between the overconsumption of soursop with neurodegenerative disease. Yes, those who follow a predominantly plant-based diet may show the lowest prevalence and incidence of Parkinson's disease, but plant-based nutrition is not just about reducing the risk, but can also be used to manage the disease. In my video, Treating Parkinson's Disease with Diet, I discussed this case report which a diet low in animal fat, and including both whole grains every day, as well as one to two cups of strawberries a day, seem to be effective in reducing symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But there are like you know, 20,000 edible plants out there, and only a limited number of them have been studied for anti-Parkinson's activity. One plant that's got a lot of attention is coffee which may exert a protective effect against the development of Parkinson's disease, and may even help slow down the progression of the disease, based on studies like this, that show that Parkinson's patients who drink coffee or caffeinated tea appear to cut their risk of dying prematurely in half. But correlation doesn't mean causation. You don't know if caffeine really works until you put it to the test. Caffeine, for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. A six-week randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind study 
The caffeine group was started out at approximately a cup of coffee's worth of caffeine twice a day, once in the morning and once after lunch, and then increasing it to two cups worth twice a day, which would be like four cups of black tea twice a day, or six cups of green. And a significant improvement in Parkinson's symptoms within three weeks compared to placebo. A cheap, safe, simple treatment for Parkinson's, though an important limitation was the duration of the study. Uh, caffeine has what's called a tachyphylactic property, meaning its effects tend to diminish over time with repeated use, at least when trying to combat sleepiness. So it would be really nice to see the study repeated over a longer time frame, uh, but there was no such longer study until five years later randomizing Parkinson's patients to about two cups of coffee worth of caffeine twice a day for not six weeks, but more than six months, and no benefit over placebo. Ah, rats. Caffeine did not provide sustained symptomatic benefit after all, so caffeine may have a short-term benefit which quickly dissipates. Regardless, caffeine cannot be recommended as a symptomatic therapy for Parkinsonism. For decades, Japan has had the longest life expectancy in the world, while spending just a fraction on health care compared to other high-income countries. This longevity has been attributed in part to Japanese dietary patterns, which are thought to have contributed to their comparatively low rates of coronary artery disease. Japan has historically had amongst the lowest rates of colon cancer, uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, bladder and blood cancers. Japan, however, has among the highest rates of stomach cancer. Yes, Japanese men may have had seven times less prostate cancer than Americans, but got six times more stomach cancer. Is there some Achilles heel in the Japanese diet? One of the first theories proposed in the 1970s was that it was the talc used to polish white rice to give it a glossy sheen. That was the case with ovarian cancer, which led to billions in damages against Johnson & Johnson's baby powder, as I detailed in a previous video. But that did not appear to be the case with stomach cancer. Is it just genetics? No. Studies on Japanese migrants show that as they and their children westernize their diets and lifestyles, uh, their stomach cancer rates drop accordingly. Well, the most well-established risk factor for stomach cancer is H. pylori, a bacteria that infects the lining of the stomach and causes the chronic inflammation that can lead to cancer. H. pylori infection is considered a group 1 carcinogen, indicating our highest level of certainty that it indeed causes cancer. Korea and Japan have the highest rates of stomach cancer and among the highest incidence of H. pylori infection. Case closed then, right? The mystery seemed to have been solved. But then came the African enigma. Countries such as Nigeria had even more H. pylori, but only a fraction of Japan's stomach cancer rates. Then came the Indian enigma. H. pylori is twice as prevalent in India than Japan, yet Indians get 10 times less stomach cancer. Obviously, H. pylori alone can't explain Japan's epidemic. Though most cases of stomach cancer are thought caused by H. pylori, most people with H. pylori don't get cancer. H. pylori is one of the most common human infections. It's been estimated that half of the world's adult population is infected with H. pylori, yet half of us don't get stomach cancer. There must be some kind of cofactor in countries like Korea and Japan that explains their elevated cancer rates. The inflammation caused by H. pylori may just set the stage for cancer formation, increasing the susceptibility of the stomach lining to dietary carcinogens. But what's so carcinogenic about Korean and Japanese diets? Studies that have compared the dietary components of different Asian populations with similar H. pylori rates, but dramatically different stomach cancer rates, have suggested preserved salted foods, both fish and vegetables, as the culprits. Um, fresh vegetables and fruits, on the other hand, were associated with an 85% reduction in stomach cancer odds, whereas consumption of fresh fish doesn't appear associated with stomach cancer either way. A review of 60 studies 
found that the consumption of pickled foods was associated with significantly higher rates of stomach cancer, though more so in Korea than Japan, perhaps because per capita Korean consumption of salt-fermented vegetables like kimchi is five to eight times greater. Uh, you can't know for sure, though, until you put it to the test. Pickled vegetable extracts can cause DNA damage in cells in a petri dish, but what about in people? Researchers in Vancouver fed people 30 ounces of fukujinzuke, assorted vegetables pickled in soy sauce, or pickled cucumbers over a three-day period. Biopsies taken from their stomach lining before the experiment started were normal, as were the biopsies taken after eating fresh carrots or cucumbers. But after just a few days of consuming pickled vegetables, moderate to severe tissue abnormalities were found suggestive of stomach irritation. The consumption of non-fermented soy foods, such as tofu, edamame, and soy milk, is linked to a lower risk of stomach cancer in Japan, whereas no association was found with fermented soy foods, even highly salted miso. The protection afforded by soy foods was attributed to the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects of the isoflavone compounds in soybeans. Um, salt itself isn't considered a direct carcinogen, but it may damage the stomach lining, thin the protective mucus layer, enhance H. pylori colonization, enhance the penetration of carcinogens, and enhance the formation of carcinogens. Even moderately high salt intake is associated with a significantly increased risk of stomach cancer, uh, though in Japan this effect may be limited to those already suffering from H. pylori-induced inflammation. H. pylori is typically treated with a cocktail of multiple antibiotics. Is there any way to eradicate it naturally through diet? We'll find out next. The salting and pickling of fish produces a novel DNA-mutating chemical called CMBA, which is formed from a reaction of the salt, nitrite preservatives, and methionine, an amino acid found concentrated in animal proteins. The nitrites can also interact with other protein components to form N-nitroso compounds, a powerful class of carcinogens found in cigarette smoke. This may explain why processed meats, such as bacon, ham, hot dogs, lunch meat, sausage, have been tied to increased stomach cancer risk, but this extends to fresh, unprocessed, unsalted meat as well. But wait, I, I thought most stomach cancer was caused by an infection with a stomach bacteria called H. pylori. There's a synergistic interaction between H. pylori-induced inflammation gastritis and diet in the formation of stomach cancer. Uh, check it out. Researchers in China discovered that even in genetically vulnerable individuals infected with a particularly pathogenic strain of H. pylori did not appear to be at increased risk of stomach cancer unless they ate about an ounce or more of pork per day. An average pork chop is like six ounces. This is a striking example of how our diet can sometimes trump both our genes and environmental influences like cancer-causing infections. But is there a way to wipe out the H. pylori in the first place? Normally, you'd use a triple antibiotic cocktail of drugs to kill off H. pylori, but patient compliance is difficult to maintain due to the quantity of drugs taken and the adverse side effects. Anything we can eat to wipe them out instead. Decades before the detoxifying and anti-cancer abilities were discovered, sulforaphane, that remarkable compound in cruciferous vegetables, was originally described for its antimicrobial activity. After hearing anecdotal reports of individuals with H. pylori-induced peptic ulcer disease experiencing dramatic and sometimes unexpected relief after eating three-day-old broccoli sprouts, Researchers at Johns Hopkins University and elsewhere decided to put broccoli sprouts to the test. Not only did broccoli sprout extracts kill antibiotic-resistant strains of H. pylori in a petri dish, some patients who were given as little as a third of a cup of broccoli sprouts a day for a week were able to eradicate their H. pylori infection. So how about a randomized controlled trial, broccoli sprouts versus alfalfa sprouts, and those given two to three servings of broccoli a day worth of sprouts were able to significantly cut down on markers of both H. pylori colonization and stomach lining inflammation. Though broccoli sprouts may be able to eradicate H. pylori in the majority of patients, 
the standard triple drug antibiotic therapy is much more effective, about 90% eradication. Still, for those who don't meet the criteria for drug treatment, cruciferous vegetables may present a, a safe, natural way to combat H. pylori in the development of stomach cancer. A compilation of 22 population studies found that eating more cruciferous vegetables was associated with a significantly lower stomach cancer risk, but broccoli has never been directly put to the test, but garlic has. Observational studies dating back to the 1960s on Japanese migrants have suggested that allium family vegetables, garlic and onion family vegetables, may be protective against stomach cancer. To date, there have been dozens of such studies published, and overall eating lots of allium vegetables was indeed associated with significantly lower stomach cancer risk. There's evidence of publication bias, though, meaning there appears to have been other studies that maybe failed to show such an effect that were shelved and never published. Even if this weren't the case, observational studies can never prove cause and effect. Maybe low garlic and onion consumption didn't contribute to stomach cancer, for example, but rather stomach cancer contributed to low garlic and onion consumption. Uh, decades of H. pylori stomach inflammation leading up to the cancer may have led to individuals choosing bland diets to avoid discomfort. You can't know if garlic really helps until you put it to the test. Louis Pasteur was evidently the first to describe the antibacterial effect of onion and garlic juices. Petri dish studies have shown that garlic is effective in suppressing the growth of H. pylori at concentrations achievable in the stomach with a single clove. Even some antibiotic resistant strains are susceptible. But does this translate into stopping the growth of cancer? A randomized, double-blind controlled trial was launched to find out. Thousands of individuals at high risk for stomach cancer from 13 villages in China were randomized into various combinations of antibiotics, garlic supplements, and antioxidant supplements. And just a few weeks of antibiotics led to a significant decrease in subsequent precancerous stomach growth seven years later, and a significant decrease in subsequent stomach cancer by 15 years. What about the garlic? No benefit by seven years and only a non-statistically significant reduction after 15 years. But in 2019, we got the 22-year update, 15 years after the study ended, and those who had taken the garlic did indeed have a significantly lower risk of subsequently dying from cancer, though interestingly the protective effect of garlic only seemed to manifest among non-drinkers. Thank you.